Good morning, church family. It's so wonderful to be with you here. Um, as many of you may know that this month is Women's History Month, and we've been celebrating and acknowledging the women in our lives who have had an impact on history. Uh, many of you have been celebrating the fact that we have the very first vi woman vice president, Kamala Harris. And even within our own church, we have the very first African-American who was selected to the Petaluma City School Board, and that is our Joanna Pond. And so I'm just excited um, on behalf of all the women to be able to bring to you and acknowledge that this is a great time in history. And um, just as we celebrate women in history and looking at the impact that they have had on our lives, I think it's important that we look at our women leaders, even in the Bible. And so in honor of uh, Women's History Month, I want to take an opportunity to highlight one particular woman in the Bible. Now, there's all sorts of women that we can identify in the Bible who are leaders, but there's one woman in particular, and that is Miriam. You see, Miriam is known as a freedom fighter. Even in the book of Micah, um, Miriam has, has been identified as being with Moses and Aaron as leaders who helped free the Israelites from slavery. Miriam is even known as the very first prophetess, which is me mainly a woman or a woman who's been sent by God. And so as we celebrate Miriam's life today, I want us to examine her actions and, and to see how God used her um, and to see how what things that she did right as well as the things that she did wrong. And we'll see um, just how God used Miriam. Now, there are three life skills that we can learn by examining Miriam's life. Those three skills are how to protect, how to praise, and how to protest. So how to protect, how to praise, and how to protest. Now, before I read to you the story of the first time that we meet Miriam in the book of Exodus, let me give you a little backstory. So the children of Israel had began to multiply, and the king at the time devised a plan to oppress the Israelites. He was concerned that through the growth of the Israelites and through their multiplication and increasing in number, that if there ever was a war, that they would outnumber the king. And so the first plan that he decided to use was to call upon the midwives of the Israelites, and he asked that they would kill the, uh, the first child or kill the baby if it turned out to be a boy, that the midwife would kill them. And if it was a girl they would let them live. Now, what is interesting, and we talk about leaders, even in the, um, in the Bible, these midwives were leaders themselves because they feared God more than they feared uh, the, uh, Pharaoh. Because they told Pharaoh that, you know what, those Hebrew women, they're strong, and, and we weren't able to even get to the home to help with the delivery because they gave birth to the boys before we could even do it. And so God honored them because they, honored him first over Pharaoh. And so with this backstory, we know that the Israelite boys were being threatened. And Pharaoh decided that if the, the plan with the midwives wasn't going to work, he passed an order that every male child would be killed in the Nile. So then we pick up the story, and let me read for you Exodus chapter 2 starting with verse one. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the, the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to see it. She opened it and saw the baby. 
He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is the one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. So in this passage, we meet Miriam for the very first time. And I think it's interesting that in this situation, we don't even know Miriam's name at this point. All that we know that she is the older sister of Moses. She's been taking care of her brother for about three months. And um, historians say that she's probably about 11 or 12 years old. And she's been protecting and working with her mom to care for her baby brother. And she stands at a distance to see what would happen to him. Now, some of us, we have siblings that we don't like, and let's, let's be honest. Um, not me, of course, I, I love my brothers. But some of us, we have siblings, and um, the only reason that we're gonna stand at a distance to see it, what would happen to them is to see how fast they would sink. But in Miriam's case, she acted quickly. There was this love and concern for her brother. And I think it should be noted that as, as Christians, if we see someone that is in danger, we need to be like Miriam. We need to act quickly. Um, if we see that they're drifting away from the church, don't wait to see how far they will sink in, in, the, in their despair, but we must act quickly and reach out to save them. Now, some of you, you might listen to the story and you think, wow, this is like, this is a fluke. Is this real? Could this really be happening that somehow a woman who, who was caring for her child puts this child in a basket in the Nile, the very river where other male child or babies are sent to die, and then somehow miraculously um, her sister's watching, and you know, just in the perfect time, a woman, Pharaoh's daughter, comes down and bathes and happens to see the child in the river and hears the baby cry, has this heart for him. And then she, here comes a girl just in the nick of time to say, do you want me to go get somebody to care for this child? And then the person that she actually got was the, the boy's mother. And so then the boy's mother gets to take the child back to her home, raise him for probably, historians say, for maybe the first 10, 12 years of his life. So a pivotal point in a child's life, who now Moses ends up back in his, very, his parents' home so that he can be influenced and, and cultured and nurtured at a, a key point in his life. And the mother gets paid to do this. Some, this is like a Hollywood story. I mean, how does this happen? People would say, oh, you know, when two people meet and um, they find out that they're actually related, the stars are aligned or, or the universe made it happen. No, the union and the, re, the, the bringing back of this mother with her child, that's not the stars being aligned. That's due to the one who, who put the stars in the sky, the one who created the universe. That is the work of the divine providence of God. You see, there's a doctrine called divine providence, providence. And it says that God is sovereign over the universe and he governs creation as a loving father, working th all things for good. Through divine providence, God accomplishes his will. God governs the affairs of humans and works through natural order of things. Throughout the Bible, there are multiple examples of the doctrine of divine providence. When you think about Abraham and Isaac is on um, the altar and he's about to sacrifice him, he, you know, there's a ram in the bush and some might say that's coincidence. No, that is divine providence. Um, even Joseph, who was sold into slavery, 
And then years later, his brothers come to him because they are in need of food. And it just so happens that um, the, the very place that Joseph was sold into, he now is the administrator, the head person, and he's got the keys to the pantry. And now he's able to feed his brothers. That's divine providence. I even think about how I got to village, um, the fact that I was married in Memphis, and before I was married, there was a couple in Memphis temporarily, and their pastor or the person who was planning to marry them uh, wanted them to go to a couples class, a pre-marriage counseling class, and that couple and myself and Oren ended up at the very same class. And, you know, I don't want to make a, a story too long, but some 20 plus years later, I am here today because of that marriage, that union that was planning um, back then brought me to village. And this is why I'm here today. I tell you, that is an example of God's divine providence. And there's a passage of scripture in the New Testament, Romans 8, 28. And this, you, you all know this one, but it says that, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. I love this passage because it reminds me that in every situation, bad, good, ugly, beautiful, big, small, it makes no difference, but for those who confess their love for Jesus, that he will work all things according to his purpose and that he will work out every situation for his glory. And so we must be like Miriam um, with this first life skill that she teaches us and she teaches us how to protect. Now, there are two key points to when you look at uh, Miriam's commitment to protecting her brother. The first point is that she doesn't have a title. And the second point is that she's young in age. And so it tells us as Christians that we don't need a special title. We don't need to be of a certain age to be willing to be used by God to, to protect others. You know, even a manager at work will often wait to promote somebody once that they see that they have been doing the work. They're not willing to just give you that promotion if you have not demonstrated that you have the skills or capabilities to do the job. And it's interesting that even as Christians, we want the, the title without doing the work. We, we, we want to be, um, we, we want to sit back and wait even on pastor to, for him to ask us to do the work without us being um, volunteering on our own. It's interesting that Miriam's mother, she didn't ask her to stand by and watch and make sure what, hap what would happen to her brother. She did it on her own. Why? Because she was concerned and she wanted to ensure protection for her brother. I want to ask you, are you waiting for the title? Do you want the fame before you're willing to do the work? Will you honor God's plan without recognition? I think it's funny how sometimes people, they won't help somebody unless others are looking. You know, will, are you, sometimes you'll give your $2 to the homeless person, but then you'll take out your $800 uh, iPhone and you'll do a selfie of you and the homeless person that you just gave your $2 to. And then you'll post it on Facebook and Instagram, hoping that you'll get some likes and some applause and some amens because you were willing to do something kind for somebody else. But I'm encouraging encouraging you all. We've got to be willing to step out and protect others, even without a title and without the glitz and the glam. Now, the next life skill that we learn from examining Miriam's life is how to praise. How to praise. In chapter 15 of Exodus, we fast forward and we see Miriam as a grown woman, and she's probably about 40 years old. And by this time, the Israelites, they have escaped Egypt, uh, but Pharaoh and his army is chasing after them. And you probably know the story 
of the Red Sea, the famous story where Moses held up his hand and he split, uh, God himself used Moses and his staff to separate the waters, allowing the children of Israel to walk through on dry land while Pharaoh's army was on their heels. So this is a a big deliverance, a, a saving, if you will, by the hand of God. And so if we look at Exodus, we here we see that there is a praise song that follows this deliverance. And in Exodus chapter 15, verses 19 through 21, it says, when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry land. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to, sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and rider he has hurled into the sea. Miriam, in this moment steps into her leadership position. She demonstrates her leadership and, and she acknowledges that, that this is a mighty deliverance. And with that, she leads the women in a song of praise. And when you examine her praise closely, you see that there is a physicality to her worship. It says that she grabbed the tambourine and the women grabbed their tambourines and they danced and they praised God for the deliverance. Now, I know men, you might think, well, that's that's the women, you know, Miriam, she's, yes, she's a trailblazer. She, she led the women and, and they danced, but you know, David himself danced as well. So men, you're not excluded from dancing before the Lord and, and using your whole body to praise and worship God. I wanna ask you this, I'm curious, how has the pandemic affected your praise? Has the pandemic, has it even interrupted your praise? You see, when we were in the church um, having worship on Sunday mornings, we would often, the, the praise and worship would, would be so high. Sometimes we would be marching around and, and clapping our hands and raising our hands, excited to express our praise and adoration to God. But now that you are sheltered in place, has the pandemic interrupted your praise? Now, I know some of you, you know, even when we were in church and, and praise might have been an all-time high, that, that was too much for you because you were worried about people watching you and you're a little nervous about you raising your hands. But now that you're sheltered in place, nobody's watching you. But has the pandemic interrupted your praise? Some of us, we, we, we are so excited about getting the vaccine because the, the vaccine will allow us to move freely. Uh, I've been talking to my coworkers and some of them are like, hey, I got my first vaccine. My arm is a little sore, but I'm not afraid to get out and move about um, because I feel a little, little protected. Some of us, we, we act just like that. We're waiting for something special, something to create a safety. But I want to tell you that you can praise God. You can still move about just because you're not in this building right now. You can praise God anywhere at any point in time and be a leader like Miriam and praise God with your whole body. Now, the third life skill that we learn from Miriam is how to protest. Now, in the case of Miriam, we learn how not to protest. When you look at the next time Miriam is mentioned in the Bible, it is in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 12, verse one and two reads, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. First, you hear 
Miriam and Aaron protesting the fact that uh, Moses has an interracial relationship. He's married a Cushite um, who is by region from Ethiopian. So she's a, a dark skinned woman. And in that particular time, yes, that may have been a, a cause to protest or raise a few eyebrows because you are in an interracial marriage, but that's really not the core of Aaron and Miriam's protest. Because the, the very next sentence there in verse two says, has the Lord spoken only to Moses? You see, the source of their protest is really about why did God choose them, uh, choose Moses and not to them? If you look a little further, you might realize that there's jealousy behind their protest. See, they're, they're protesting the fact that God chose to speak directly to Moses and not to them. Now, the definition of, of, um, of jealousy, because this is something that we, we need to be aware of, the, the definition of jealousy is feeling of resentment against someone because that person's uh, rivalry or success or advantage. When we protest, we've got to be careful that there's not jealousy in our hearts because this can become a severe sickness. I saw a sign once that said, uh, jealousy is a disease, get well soon. You see, when you have jealousy in your heart, it can cause you to do some really stupid things like violently questioning God's choice and leadership such that you protest and you storm Capitol buildings. Jealousy in your heart can cause you to do some really stupid things, like hate another person because of the color of their skin. Even jealousy uh, can cause you to deny the equality of someone else and begin to oppress others. Even as Christians, sometimes there's jealousy in our hearts and we're concerned that we're not going to get our piece of the kingdom pie as if God doesn't have enough to supply all of us with our whole pie. But yet you allow jealousy to drive your protest. There's even a physiological term called jealousy protest. And it shows up oftentimes in infants. Researchers have identified that when a, a baby is being cared for and the one who is caring for that baby turns their attention or does something else, the baby will often cry out in protest. And they call that jealousy protest. I can remember clearly even as Caleb and Kendall, when Kendall was a newborn and Caleb was in the home and he started crying out for some reason. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I, I fed him. I, I, I made sure that he wasn't hurt, but yet he still kept crying out. And he's the older brother. And yet I'm caring for his, his sister, but I'm giving my attention to her. And suddenly I had to realize after about three hours of him crying out that this is jealousy protest. And so even as Christians, we will act like that. When the attention is not on us and it's in a different direction, we will often cry out in protest, but at the core of that may be jealousy. And so as we think about and we celebrate the life of Miriam, and you think about the impact that she has made, not only in um, during the book of Exodus and the, um, the freedom of the children of Israel, she still has an impact on our lives today. And so as you reflect this week, I wanna give you three questions to ponder on. One is, who is God calling you to protect? Who is God calling you to protect? And young people in particular, Gen Y and Gen Z, uh, your generation needs protection. 
And I'm sad to say it's probably going to be up to you to do the protecting because my generation, things are moving so fast with technology and everything else that it is going to be hard for us to catch up. But I want to encourage young people, you don't need to have a thousand likes uh, or followers on TikTok or have a thousand likes on YouTube to be used. Um, God wants to use you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. So he's calling young people to even protect and stand up for those who might be in danger. The second question is, which room will you praise God in this week? I mentioned that praising God um, should be a whole body experience. And, and I want you to spend some time this week and practice your praise because, you know, the pandemic is almost over and there's going to come a time when we can come back in and fellowship. And I want that, that, that praise and worship to be so high and mighty. But I tell you, you might need to spend some time this week and practice your praise. Um, some of you are waiting on a building to come back and praise God. Well, guess what? You're in a building right now, most likely listening to this sermon, whether it's your home, whether it's your apartment. I encourage you to, to find a room or two. Some of you've got a three bedroom, four bedroom apartments or houses. Some of you have two stories that you can spread out. Pick a room this week and I want you to spend some time and praise God, praise him. And you, it doesn't have to be some Red Sea deliverance experience. Just praise him for who he is. And then I want you to use your body. You say you, you don't have a tambourine. You don't have anything. You've got two hands. Begin to clap your hands and to praise God. I remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were going outside and they were howling, and, and, and it would start a trend. And, and for whatever reason, people started howling. Well, I want you to use this week, and we're at the end, uh, almost at the end of the pandemic, and I want you to start a trend this week. You go outside, and you go out, and you start praising your hands, and you start screaming and lifting your voice up to the Lord. Let your neighbors know. Let your community know that God is here. God is sovereign. God is divine, and he's working all things out for his good. So I want you to get out and find some space, whether it's in your home or in your backyard, and use this time this week to practice on your praise. And then lastly, why are you protesting? What's at the core of your protest? See, we've got plenty of things that we've been protesting about. It seems like every time I turn around, I get an email from change.org on, you know, sign this petition or, you know, you go by the, at the grocery store and somebody's out there getting you to sign a petition. So we've got plenty of things that we want to protest about. But ask yourself, am I protesting for justice or, for, or because of jealousy? See, when you protest for justice, that requires that you think about the other persons who are being oppressed. You think outwardly, but if you're protesting because of jealousy, it causes you to focus on you and what you might not be getting. And I want to encourage you to protest because of justice, because jealousy can be a sickness that needs healing. And when we look at the final stages of Miriam's life, even in that um, chapter, um, the book of, of Numbers, it tells the final story of Miriam. God dealt harshly with her protest of jealousy. So she was struck with leprosy. And some might ask, why was Miriam struck with leprosy and not Aaron? Well, the Bible even mentions her name first. So most people think that it was she was the ringleader in the protest. And yet she was struck with leprosy. But God is merciful. And because Aaron and Moses prayed and they plead to God, she only had to deal with leprosy for seven days. And she was restored to the family and to the community. So I want you to take some time this week and ask God, spend some time in prayer and ask him, what am I protesting? What's the source? Is it for justice or is it for jealousy? 
And if there's anything that is unholy and unrighteous about my protest, pray and ask God to heal you. In Jesus' name, amen.